Okay, so now I'm going to go into a little bit of branding. And the reason why, I don't want to get too deep in licensing because you're going to have uh, a couple people coming in, I think it's next week, mm -hmm. they're going to be coming in from CLC, so a couple of my former colleagues, and they're going to talk a little, a little bit more about licensing, so I don't want to kind of stop what they're going to do, but I do want to talk a little bit about branding because I mentioned earlier that licensing and branding are two things that, um, that really interest me. And first of all, you know, what is, what is branding? That's what we have to understand. So it's creating a unique name image for a product so that when consumers see it, they understand it. And doing that through some kind of advertising campaign. And there's a lot of definitions for branding. This is just one of a generic one that you can probably go find in 500, but it'll probably give you, um, excuse me, an idea. But now the important part here, the underlying is, is consistent. And you'll get this here in just a minute. So what do we consider a successful brand? It's one, first of all, when you see it, you know it. You don't have to think about it. Number two is gives a positive reflection. So when you see that, you have positive feelings about it. You understand it, and you're like, wow, that's a great company. That's what, as from a branding person, that's what you people think when you see their logo, their image, their phrase, their commercials, whatever the case may be. And then also, it's all it's it's more than just the logo, it's about the product and the service that you're providing. So all three of those things combine which creates a successful brand. I'll give you some examples of some, some brands here. Now I think, for example, for UPS, and it's, it's really weird subconsciously, I was putting this together, I didn't think about it until <coughs> last night when I was running through this, that three of the four companies are in a base or have some kind of major you know, operations in Atlanta. So maybe it's because I see it all the time in Atlanta, the reason why I came up with these three brands. But I think, for example, UPS, I think for most people, you could probably cover that up and that shield logo, and a lot of people would know what that is by the color, its consistency. You always see that kind of two-tone two brown and, and gold color. So that, to me, is a very successful brand because they've been very consistent over the years using that. The Chick-fil-A one. They don't even say Chick-fil-A on here. I know exactly who it is. I think everybody in here knows who that is. And it doesn't even say Chick-fil-A. They didn't even have a logo on there. But this is a very consistent brand campaign that they've done a really good job with over the years. So when you see that, you know exactly what it means. <coughs> McDonald's. I could take away everything else and just put the golden arches on there. Everybody would know what that is because it's been around for years. They've been very consistent in their brand. And then Coca-Cola. This is not even in English. But I know because of the way the can is and the, the script letter that they use, I know exactly what it is. So if you look at something that's not even in your language and you know what it is, that's a very successful brand. There's some other ones as well. And I put these up here because if you notice, they're just logos. They didn't have a name on it. Now, over the years, they used to have names. They've dropped them over time because people know them. They know what these stand for. And what's even better about the first two, the Nike one, they have nicknames. The logos have nicknames. So you have the Swoosh. And then you have the Chevrolet. You have the bow tie. So that's even better when people come up with nicknames for your own, for your own brand. And then Apple. I'll give you an example here. That's a good job over the years, the evolution of their mark. Now you can tell, obviously, the very first one, it's hard to see on that. That's an, that's an old mark. No one knows what that is, no one remembers that. But, see, I don't know about you guys, you may not remember this, but I was born a year after this one right here. So I'm 36 years old, so I was born in 77. And uh, so I remember that mark all the way through the 80s and obviously through 1998. But what they've done, they evolved with their, their consumer base. They went to this platinum look here because it's, it's new age, it's you're ahead of the times, kind of how we are in 2014, 2015. But they kept the mark consistent. They may have changed their color a little bit, there's no argument of what logo that is. So we're talking about logos and logo changes. So back in 2010, this is a little case study I did. I, did, I gave a very similar presentation to this back in 2010, and this was the example I was using. This is when Starbucks and Gap had just changed their marks. And I asked that class where I, I posed a question to the class of, do you think this, this will work? Do you think there's going to be a lot of um, kickback from the consumer? Do you think they're going to like it? No one knew at that time. This was actually brand new. So let's look at the results of what happened. So we'll look at Starbucks. So again, very similar to Apple. They kept the core of their messaging, they kept the core of their mark. And it's changed a little bit. 
And they, and they kind of had to, a little political correctness in some of these things right here. And the big joke is, if you, if you look at it, it looks like they kind of get closer and closer and closer and zero in on the siren, the mermaid, whatever you want to call it. So the big joke is one day it's just going to be one green dot because they're just going to focus in so far on it. But I was really curious about this because my beef with this logo change, this brand change, was it took away the most important part, in my opinion at the time, the name Starbucks is no longer on it. And I didn't know if the consumer or the fan of Starbucks, if they were more attracted to the sign logo or the use of Starbucks. So I thought it was pretty, I thought at the time it was kind of a risky move. But again, they were still using the, uh, the core mark, so the consumers didn't kick back too much. Plus, guess what? As I said earlier, the product is still good. They have good service, at least people, I don't, I'm not, I don't drink coffee, so I'm a, not a big Starbucks guy, but my wife is. And they still have a good product. And they still have the sleeve, and they still use the Starbucks name as well. So this is an example of, of a change, an evolution, just like Apple, that went well. But it was a nice little piece study over the years. Now, one that didn't go so well was Gap. And I don't know if you noticed, but the one on the left was their old logo, but is now their current logo. And this is the one they went to. This lasted four months. I've never seen that. Before, exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> it went four in 2010. It went for four months. And they lost their way. What's the what's the difference between this and what Apple and what Starbucks did? Exactly right. They got away from the core brand. Now, the difference is that when Starbucks did it, they were still a good solid business. Gap at the time was struggling. They just needed to change their identity. And that's why sometimes when you see companies go through crisis like this BP or something like that that has something major that happens, one of the first things they do is they change their logo. Because back to my point earlier was when you see that, you want that recognition, you want that positive recognition. You don't want the negative recognition. So that's the reason why a lot of people do that. So Gap actually was struggling a little bit, so they changed their logo at this time. And the only thing they kept out of the original brand was the box and then this little blue square because they thought that was what was important. But the consumer said, no, it's the font. It's, you know, that's what we've learned to, to know right there. And they got so far away from it, to your point exactly, they got so far away from it that there was, the consumers were upset. So they ended up going back to it four months later. Now, some said that it was all publicity stuff because they just want people to talk about Gap again. But uh, the, fan, the, the fans and the consumers were not happy at all. So we'll get to college a little bit here. And these are three, what I think are the most, not the most, but three of the most powerful brands that are out there. Now, Texas and North Carolina, they both had perfect storms where when they were winning national championships or contending for national championships on an annual basis, the burnt orange in Texas case and the Columbia baby blue, we're gonna call it for Carolina blue, they were really hot in the market. They were fashion colors at the time. So when they were winning, <coughs> their merchandise was going national across all the country. And so that was kind of a perfect store for them. But the key for them is that when they were in a hot market situation, when the spotlight was on them, they kept their message consistent. And it's very, it's, it's a very enticing that when you're in a spotlight, to kind of change yourself or you know, we want to put a, you know, we don't like our logos, so let's put something else to put better out there. But the schools and the brands that keep themselves and they know who they are and they keep it consistent. They come out of the rent a lot better. Now, Ohio State, this is, this is an interesting one. So, they made a huge campaign to make themselves the flagship state of the university. Of the University of State, sorry. And the reason why is in Ohio, you got a ton of four year schools, a lot of FBS level schools, a lot of competition trying to get the students there. So, back in the 1980s, I believe, they started a campaign where they wanted people to know them as something else. Does anybody know? What their name is, the school, what the university's name is. Was that not? Well, no, the name of the university. The exactly right. The Ohio State University. There's a lot of schools out there that are known as the whatever. There's the University of Memphis, the University of Oklahoma, but no one calls them that. They just call them Oklahoma or OU or Memphis, where the case may be. But it was a concentrated effort that the university made. They want to be known as the Ohio State University. Now, where I remember that coming from is we're watching Monday Night Football. Yeah, and they put emphasis so, on something. You know how they get emphasis yeah. to the Ohio State yeah. University? That was, that, was a, that was an intentional marketing campaign the university had. And as obnoxious as I thought it was, my wife went to Ohio State, so I can say that a little bit. 
um, they got the point across. Because I give her a hard time. It's like, oh, it's the Ohio State, like you're some fair school than anything else. But, like I said, as you know, in your face as it was, it worked. Because a lot of people know them now as the Ohio State University. <coughs> so, what is your brand? What are you known as? What is, a lot of people call it a reputation, but I don't like to call it a reputation. I like to call it a brand. When people see you in the hallway, what do they know you as? Or what do you think their impressions are? Do they think of these three things? Are you a successful brand? You know, do they, the, and I think the number two point here is the most important one. A positive one, trust, loyalty. Those are three important things. So I want you to consider yourself a brand as you're going through the rest of your career here and you get into the workplace. Now, you get a little bit of a redo. Where you are right now, you're branding right now, you are who you are, and it's really hard to change your brand. It really is. So when you get out in the real world, you're gonna have a second opportunity to rebrand yourself a little bit. Because no one's gonna know you unless you're still working here, whatever the case may be. No one knows you, so you're gonna have a chance. So I urge you, when you start your new career, when you start your career in general, understand that it's your job to yourself to set your brand and what you wanna be known as. And trust me, it takes years to build a brand. You've heard this before. It takes seconds to kill a brand and kill a reputation. You gotta keep that in mind. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a brand. So what I'm going to do is, we're going to get real for a couple minutes here. I wasn't going to leave here and just you know, teach you about some kind of industry and not talk about life in general or career because I think this is what, if you get anything out of what I present today, this is the part that I want us to kind of talk about. And uh, hopefully I want to give you a little bit of advice. So someone that's been in the workforce for 13 years, uh, came through the major like you guys are doing right now, um, I, th I think it's my responsibility to just shed a little light on some things. Now the first light here, the first light here, is the millennials versus the old fogies. And I'm the old fogie, by the way. Any reaction from this slide? I just want to start off with that. Go ahead. Uh, will, will you plan on retiring? It's good, not a bad guess. Not where I was going with it, but it's... What's that now? What does millennials, I mean, does, does millennials mean anything to you? I feel like you're talking about people who grew up, like, in okay. 2000, like, with all the technology and stuff. Okay. So, do you, have you ever heard or know what the perceptions of millennials are? I mean, you, yeah. everybody in this room, you're millennials. So, do you know what people think of millennials? They got to take out the Don't You know what? I'm glad you said that. I'll bring that up a little bit later on, but it's a good, it's a good point. Look at that. We had this conversation right before. Not a thing. We rely on technology Okay. Everything else? Right. Exactly right. First of all, I'm glad that you know that. Because knowing it is half the battle, as they say. Because um, you can acknowledge that. Now, Everything is given to you. you know, the, the things that I come across is that uh, a millennial wants to be promoted before they can actually do the job. So a millennial, this is just a perception. A millennial will come in and say, I'm not gonna do that job until you give me a raise to do it or you give me a promotion. When that's not the way it works. You do the job first and then you get the promotion. And sometimes that's the perception of millennials. Now, I'm not saying that's the case here in this room, but it's a perception that's out there. And then as people like myself, the Gen Ys, the baby boomers, and ones that, those are the people that are running the companies today. So I'm not saying that I'm right and you're wrong, but guess what? These are the people that are running the businesses out there. So it's important that you understand the perception about your generation so that when you go in, you can prove them wrong, or at least be aware of it. Because I think sometimes, even myself, you know, we were kind of, we talked about this earlier, where the Gen Xs were not really leaders, we're just more followers. That's what we are, we're not, we're not standing out, we're you know, a little bit more effective, just like you guys are more efficient than I am. My boss right now is a Gen Wire, and he can't type. He's in there pecking away like this. 
And to me, I'm like, what's that all about? Everybody knows how to type. Well, that's just my generation. I grew up in that generation. And he's sitting there, you know, packing away. But you know what? He's a lot smarter than I am, and he's a lot better at the business than I am. So just because he can't type as fast, or he doesn't know how to tweet, or do any kind of social media, it doesn't mean anything. We get to understand that these are the people that are running the businesses in the industry. So just be aware of that. That's the point I'm trying to make in that situation. So here's some career advice, or some tips. And am I totally right on all of these? Maybe, maybe you're not. But I at least want to expose you to them and kind of give you an idea of what's out there. Now, I'm a little bit qualified, a little bit qualified on this first part because my wife is an HR manager. So um, I always consult with her before I do things like to say, okay, is this right, is this wrong, what the case may be. So the first part I'm talking about is while you're in college and then while you're applying for jobs. Gain as much experience as possible. You've heard it a billion times, and I know it's been said over and over again. You remember my story earlier when I talked about when I was at Tennessee? And I did everything from the sun that I left apart. I figured out I didn't want to do any of them. And a lot of people say that's great line, you got some good experience. But the key to that is don't think about it as just learning how to do a job, but think of all the things you do. You network, you meet people, you uh, you, you uh, meet people that eventually then get you your next job. And that's exactly what happened with me. I was in sports information. The sports information uh, there at the time was Bud Ford. And I didn't know this at the time, but he had a little bit of a pipeline between the University of Tennessee and CLC. And it was because of my connection with him, that's the only way, to be honest with you, I got that job. As they always say, it's not always what you know, but it's who you know. So when you're going out and you're getting experience, think of it in two ways. You're getting experience, you're getting job experience and real life experience, but at the same time, you're also networking. And networking is a key, whatever you do, whether you're in a classroom, if you're at a business, if you're at a bar, whatever the case may be in a social setting, you're always, always networking. Keep your resume simple. This is for my wife. A lot of people get a little too fancy, do a script writing all over it, or they do all kinds of funky backgrounds. Keep it simple, especially if you're doing an entry level job, look at just a few things. They're looking at, you know, what your degree is, you know, is it relevant to what you're applying for? Um, what school you went to, your GPA, and some of your extra activities. And real activities, not that I was the captain of QB of my rec football team. That doesn't count. But if you're a part of any kind of organization, you're doing volunteering. So keep it simple, keep it concise. Now, don't get me wrong, don't do it on a little thin piece of paper, do it on the real nice and resume paper that they have out there. So put in some effort for it. Just don't get too fancy with it, because you end up detracting more than anything else. Social media is part of your application. First thing I do, once I narrow down my candidates, I go and I look at your Facebook and Twitter or any kind of social media. I want to find out who you really are. And a lot of times, I find things and I'll say, okay, that person's now in the trash. Just to be honest with you. Is it fair? Maybe, maybe not. But it's the only way I really have an idea of getting to know you without actually getting to meet you. <coughs> So, I know when I was young, I did dumb things, did said dumb things, but the case may be, so I get it, trust me. But when you get closer to the time of you going out, looking for jobs, I highly suggest you clean up any social media that you have and put things, or take things off that you wouldn't want your parents or a future employer to see because we do look at that stuff. Be awesome. Interview, interview, interview. Even if it's a job you think you don't want, especially at this young, at your young stage of your career, go and interview for it anyway. If you get an opportunity to interview with the company, don't say no. Go and do it, get some practice. My first interview was with the Tampa Bay Lightning in an inside ticket sales job. I had no interest, again, because I was in the ticket office, I had no interest in this job, plus I don't like to do cold call. It's just not who I am. But, and that's what it was. But I went down anyway, way and I interviewed because I wanted the experience. And I figured, what's the worst case scenario? I botch it, I'm not going to get the job anyway. And I totally failed. It was one of the worst experiences in the world, at least at the time. But I learned a lot from that. And I went on a few other interviews, and I got better and better and better. Plus, you never know what's going to come out of the interview. When I was still at CLC, I interviewed at Boxer Craft for a totally different position. 
I knew I was not going to take that position. So I wanted to at least go and learn about the company and learn 